Welcome to Exploring the Mind, a partnership between the Ann Arbor District Library and the Department of Psychology at the University of Michigan. Today's talk is Working Hard at Being Normal, Gender and Intimacy in Palliative Care by Dr. Sarah McClelland. To find more Exploring the Mind videos, go to aadl.tv. Okay. All right. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Sarah McClelland. Dr. McClellan McClelland is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology, as well as the Department of Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Michigan. She completed her undergraduate degree at Brandeis University. She then received her PhD in social and personality psychology from the City University of New York, and she was a postdoctoral scholar in the Michigan Society of Fellows here at the University of Michigan. She's received many impressive awards for both her research and teaching, including, there are many others, but I'm just gonna focus on a few in the interest of time, um, the Emerging Leadership Award from the American Psychological Association, the Distinguished Early Co Career Contributions in Qualitative Inquiry Award, also from the, from the American Psychological Association, the Class of 1923 Memorial Teaching Award from the University of Michigan, and uh, the Psychology Faculty Diversity Research Award. Dr. McClellan's research examines health and well being in a wide variety of people and groups. And she also examines the role of social norms in people's intimate lives. She has studied sexual health as affected by abstinence only education policies, experiences of stigma and discrimination, and gender and sexual expectations. Dr. McClellan's talk, as you can see, is entitled Working Hard at Being Normal, Gender and Intimacy in Palliative Care. Here is Dr. Sarah McClellan. Thank you so much, Chris. And thanks everybody for uh, joining me in this video lecture. So one of the things that I'm gonna talk about, you can see in this title is Working Hard at Being Normal. But I also want to say that I've thought of a couple of other titles to help folks think about what this talk might include. And as a researcher, sometimes that means we think about alternative titles. So another way of thinking about the talk is what can clinicians do? And this might mean a variety of medical providers. What can they do to support women who may or may not desire intimacy near the end of life? So you can start to see these are going to be some of the terms that we're going to think about. Another possible title is what are the expectations and assumptions that women have for their own sexual health? And uh, in the introduction, you just heard a little bit about some of the ways that I've thought about these issues. And so one of the things that I wanted to forward, and we're gonna think about together for the next hour, is what are these issues around how people learn to be sexual? What are the norms that they learn to engage in sexual interactions with? What are the social uh, expectations that people have. And I thought about this in terms of young people as well as people at the end of life. And so I wanted to just highlight some of the work that I've done is to think about the role of teaching young people about sex education in schools, which was highlighted uh, in this article now about a decade ago. Some of my work uh, with young people is also highlighted in Peggy Orenstein's book, Girls and Sex, where she really thinks about the concept of intimate justice that I've developed and thinking about how young people learn what to expect in terms of their sexual relationships. And then also uh, more recently, this piece that uh, went very viral, which is to think about that there might be uh, exchanges that women have in their sexual relationships that uh, may not feel good to them, but they may be willing to make. So that there's just this sort of array of things that I've thought about in terms of young people's lives. And what I wanna do in this talk is also think about how so many of these issues are still quite relevant for women across the lifespan. So I'm gonna to talk today about a study uh, that brings together some of these issues, but in a time of life that we often don't think about sex and sexuality. So here's just some key terms that are gonna frame our conversation today. Uh, sex, sexuality, intimacy, thinking about the kind of range of ways people might engage with themselves or another person in their intimate lives, but really putting it in the context of illness and specifically cancer, and even more specifically, 
people who are, have been diagnosed with a cancer that puts them much closer to the end of their life. So you can see these terms are actually things we don't often think about together. So what does sex at the end of life mean? What do people think about it? And what are, might be some of the issues that psychology can help clinical care think about as people care for people near the end of life? So I wanna just do some background for folks that this might be a new topic. Um, or in fact, people watching this video, this might be something that you're thinking about in your own life. So sexual health is a really uh, big category, but it might include things like the presence or frequency of intimate touch. It might include the presence of couple support, communication, the role of intimacy. And it also might include developing sexual practices that attend to physical and or psychological changes. And these changes, of course, might be due to many things, but two of them that often co-occur are illness and aging. So one of the things that's important in terms of a background before I kind of dive into the study is really then thinking about the, specific, the specificity of what I'm gonna be talking about, which is the context of breast cancer. So when we think about cancer and its treatments, and then even more specifically breast cancer and its treatments, this might include a range of things, including surgery, including radiation, hormone therapy, chemotherapy, and then several other kinds of treatments that someone might engage with. And it's important to have as a background that these can have really substantial changes on people's bodies and impact things like genital, genital uh, um, sensitivity, thinness or thickness of skin, uh, the vulva might atrophy, um, losing uh, the kind of flexibility that it once had, um, even things like uh, the, the changes to lubrication, which we're gonna talk about. So a whole host of things that, that might be uh, a result of the treatments that someone might be going through for breast cancer, which have been really found over the years to have a huge impact on women's sexual function. So this also might be, um, this has a range of ways that this shows up in people's lives. But what we're gonna think about together today is then how do women interpret and live with some of these changes that are a result of uh, treatments for breast cancer. So with that background, I also wanna just highlight, so why might a study thinking about these issues be, be necessary? And one of the key things is that medical providers, including those who are already providers or those who are being trained, are often really ill-equipped to, to, uh, to discuss sexual health with patients. And so what this might mean is that there's a lack of language, a lack of know-how, even just a lack of background to think about how to engage with folks across a wide range of ages um, to engage with these kinds of topics with patients. So for example, in a study of health exams with older adults ages 50 to 80, physicians asked about sexual health in only 4% of the health exams. So this really indicates that certainly at a certain time of life, physicians are making assumptions about who is interested or who is not interested in learning more about sexual health and the potential changes that might be happening. And then if we even ask a little more specifically, how are people asking patients about this? We see a really limited range of language. Is everything okay down there? Which doesn't give a patient very much um, uh, background or way of thinking about it, or even more uh, awkwardly, are you having any vagina problems? So this is a way that sort of indicates that clinical providers uh, across different specialties often don't have the expertise to engage with patients, how to talk with patients, what are the things that patients might need more information in, what are the kinds of dynamics that they might be thinking about in terms of their relationships, or if they're not in a relationship, are they wishing to engage in sexual relationships in the future? So again, this starts to be also line up with some cultural assumptions about aging adults. And as the lifespan increases, what are the kinds of ex expectations that older adults have for their own sexual life, their own uh, expectations for intimacy? So, Taking that in this last bullet point, I really wanna highlight one of the key pieces of why this research felt so important and why I pursued it. 
And so I'm gonna define some of these terms, but often what's happened in medical care is that individuals in palliative stages of cancer, meaning those who have transferred from curative to uh, managing quality of life, uh, so a real shift from curative to palliative care are often imagined as outside the boundaries of sexuality. So really what I'm starting to just build here is the background to think about people who are diagnosed with later stage cancers, and in this case, later stage breast cancers, how might we help medical providers better attune themselves to thinking about the sexual health needs and the sexual health expectations for this population. So with this in mind, I just wanna walk us through a study that I did at the um, Comprehensive Cancer Center at the University of Michigan. And what this study has is a wide range of things and I'm gonna talk mostly um, about one part of the study, but I'm gonna walk us through what the larger study had. And I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about it. So in this study, it included 113 women. And I want you to just note the age range. So sometimes I'm gonna be talking about aging where you can start to see that it's women who uh, at the later age range. But I also wanna say that some of the women in the study were quite young. So the youngest woman in the study was 32. But still, because of the diagnosis, thinking about end of life issues regardless. But the mean age of this whole group was about 58 years old. 80% were partnered either in a marriage or living together. 99% of the women were heterosexually identified, but all of them were diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. So this really brings us in to thinking about what that means in terms of later stage breast diagnosis. They had lived with the original breast cancer diagnosis for about eight years during the time of the interview and had been diagnosed with metastatic cancer at, for about three years when the study occurred. They were all recruited from the University Cancer Center and the, all the data were collected during a routine medical visit. So when they were going to see their doctor. And there were three pieces of the study. They filled out, uh, they were interviewed, they filled out a survey, oops, and I also extracted information from their medical chart, which allowed me to see um, aspects of their treatments, what kinds of, um, what the timing of certain treatments were and what the wide range of treatments that they had. So with that, I just wanted to show, um, this chart is likely gonna be hard to look at in terms of the full sample, but this is the interview sample. And I just wanted to highlight just a, a little bit in terms of for folks that this might be part of their, um, their life as well. In thinking about the 32 women who were part of the study, that there was a range of uh, ways that, especially thinking about the role of chemotherapy, where and when they had received chemotherapy, and also um, what parts of the treatment and visceral disease, meaning those that were um, thinking about those who had had disease that were attached to the soft tissues. So uh, I can talk more about that. And there's certainly more in the um, publication, which I'll, I'll cite for you in the talk. But I wanted to just give a sense of how the folks in the study had a wide range of sites of metastatic disease, where the disease was located, and again, a kind of wide range of ways that they had been treated. And again, you can see, uh, here, this is the interview sample of 32 folks. So to think about this, just as we walk into the data, again, thinking about women with stage four metastatic disease, thinking about end of life issues, transitioning to palliative care away from curative care. Really the study is designed to think about assumptions about aging, illness, sexual health, thinking about the definitions of sexual health, and again, what we're really gonna think about today, as you saw with the title, what are the gender norms? And meaning that, what are the kinds of expectations over a long life? What are the ways that people have been taught to think about what they want in their sexual life, what they think they deserve in their sexual life, and how they interact with partners sometimes around that. 
So I've been talking about some words and before we dive in, I'm gonna just define a couple of terms. So metastatic disease is a cancer that's spread to the brain, liver, lymph, lungs, or bones. And that often then in this case was a, an initial breast cancer diagnosis that then spread. So just for those that might not have a background on this, of the women that developed breast, of the, of the women that develop breast cancer in their lifetime, about 5% will develop metastatic disease. And what's of concern, and of course why this becomes an issue is that the five-year survival rate is 25%, and as compared to earlier stage um, cancers, which are much higher. So this is where metastatic disease puts uh, patients much closer towards um, considering end of life issues. People may live with metastatic disease for quite a while, but in terms of the five-year survival rates, you can see that there's a shift. So the life expectancy is about 18 months, but again, this can, wide, this can vary widely. In palliative care, as I've been saying, just in terms of the definitions, a transition from curative treatments where medical provision is in order to treat the cancer. So palliative care is where quality of life concerns are really front and center, pain management being one of the key aspects of that. So I want to just, for those that like to think about uh, uh, research methods, so again, uh, the larger study has 113 women in it, and these are the things that I ask them through survey measures, quality of life, pain, issues around um, mental health and mental well-being, relationship well-being, if they were partnered, sexual function. And then what I'm going to mostly talk about today are their semi-structured interviews, which lasted um, anywhere from a half hour, but most were about an hour that I did with 32 women. They also did a card sorting procedure, which I'm happy to talk about, but I won't um, explicitly talk about in the findings today. But really that actually entailed them sorting different issues that were imp more important to them or less important to them. And again, I extracted specific issues related to their treatments from their medical record. So really what I wanna to highlight today are the implications for clinical practice. And this may be a way of thinking through and what I'm gonna, what I, how I've organized the talk is to think about four different issues related. So what are the information needs that people have? What are women's information needs regarding intimacy and sexual health? So that's gonna be the first thing we think about. Then the second thing is how, what women said that they wish they knew. So this is a kind of, using a, a, a study to really then inform future clinical provision, which is what is that, what does a group of women say, oh, I wish I'd known? What do they, what do women wish they had been told when they were diagnosed? Then in the, uh, one part of the talk, I'm gonna talk about gender and sexual labor. And another way of thinking about this is how do cultural expectations of femininity affect women's sexual well-being? And then thinking about that in the context of women diagnosed with metastatic disease. And then lastly, for those of you that are really might be interested in then what doing this kind of research looks like and feels like, I'm gonna talk about my own experiences in collecting these data and how I've have really developed some ways of, for other researchers who engage in difficult topics like this. And this is something for clinicians to think about, researchers to think about, and this is how to really develop the kinds of skills that we need to do this kind of work. What are the emotional costs? and I would argue benefits of doing research on really difficult issues like these. So these are gonna be the four things that we address today. So diving into the information needs, here's one of the participants who said, I've had all kinds of questions about sex. And like I said, there's not really anybody that you can talk to. So this is a just way of starting us off to think about the kinds of questions that patients had and the ways that they both felt comfortable seeking out care from their providers, and also the kinds of shyness, the kinds of uh, taboo that sex and thinking about and asking people about sex have, and that this is, can be quite expected. But we wanna then dive into, so what is it that people need to know more about? So one of the things that people have found for years associated with breast cancer treatment is vaginal dryness. And that can be uh, experienced in a whole host of ways. And often that's one of the major ways, one of the major things that um, doctors advise uh, breast cancer patients about through adding lubrication into their sexual life or, or other kinds of sexual aids that help with lubrication. But one of the key pieces that comes forward from the women interviewed in the study 
is that the description and the medical advice was often not explicit enough, meaning how much, where, how do I get it? So there's a way of thinking about the explicitness um, as a really key piece that women talked about. And it was not the only area of need. It's one of the major ways that providers are trying to help, but there were so many other needs and I wanna make sure that folks have a sense of that. So it was often assumed to be the only issue if it was discussed, but it, it, there were many other good issues that were brought up. Dating. So 80% of the women in this particular study were partnered, but 20% actually described themselves as, as, either, um, as either potentially dating or actively dating. So really thinking about um, issues related to seeking partners, issues related to body dissatisfaction, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, also the relationship to end of life and how clinicians might think about how to plan for end of life issues at the same time as thinking about issues related to dating. So those two things kind of co-occurring. And they wanted explicit advice about genitals, and we'll get a little bit more sense of how people talked about this in a minute. Breast prosthesis, um, there was a, a lot of women in the study who really wished for more information about that. Explicit discussion of how people's bodies might change over time. Explicit discussion about how to put one's body in relationship to another with things like sexual positions. And another thing which we'll talk about in a minute too, which is contending with partner sexual demands. So what you can see here is a whole host of uh, information needs that ask medical providers to have more information. And this, I want to say before we go any farther, it may involve a whole host of medical providers, right? So I'm not using the word oncologist, although oncologists might be one source of this information. But I think for those thinking about where they might seek out this information, it could be from a, a, a range of medical providers that you might interact with. Um, most patients in the study, though, described feeling quite nervous about talking with other people. So this is one of the ways that we can think about how do we provide this kind of information actually across the lifespan, right? This is the kind of information that people need in a whole host of moments of their life. So just to get, oops, just to give you a taste of one of the participants' ways of talking about this, she says, I'd probably say my sexual health is not good because of the fear, but in reality too, it's because I have cancer all through, down my spine and on my ribs, even on my hips. So it's pretty hard to say. And I guess it's mainly because, I don't know, because the fear of the unknown, the doctors don't tell you how far you can go and can't go. They don't even discuss what you can and can't do. So this feels like the way that we can start to see the kind of strains that patients feel which is trying both to get advice from their providers and from their doctors, and also of course the limits that doctors feel about trying to give advice. So this is the study is really an effort to give clinicians and patients greater ways of having these discussions with each other. So before we turn away from the information needs and into the other three sections, I just wanted to give folks, here's a, um, a screenshot of the citation where you can see more um, of the information from what patients talked about in terms of their kind of their information needs. So now we're going to turn to the I wish I'd known. And here is again where patients talked about what they would like to have learned about in order to think about how to help educate future people. And one of the major things which you heard in the prior section is this issue of partner education. And women consistently described their male partners, and again, most were partnered with men, described their male partners as needing more extensive information about how to understand changes to sexual health. But they really described both themselves and their partners as in the dark. But the problem was that in this case, women were expected to educate their male partners about changes. And this felt like tremendous pressure that, they, that the women would get information from their doctors and then the women themselves were expected to do this education. And one of the major themes was that women wished to, to, share this, uh, to share this labor with their medical providers to a greater extent so that they weren't the only ones doing this education. So in terms of thinking about this, women desired more focused interventions that targeted men who needed to be aware 
and increasingly sensitive to physical changes that their that their uh, women partners may be going through. And so here's an example of um, a, a patient's description of this. It would have been very helpful for him to understand that there may be changes, a kind of pre-education almost that, you know, sometimes things in that area change. In this case, she's talking genitally. And why and what might he be able to do to make it an easier experience for me as well? I think he would have liked to have known that stuff because you're kind of left in the dark about it. They just don't talk about sex, you know? So uh, this offers a, a nice way and an important way of thinking about that patient education is often one of the things that people talk about. But here we have patients talking about partner education as a really key way that they would have been supported. And also thinking about what are the specific things that, in this case, for heterosexually partnered folks, what might male partners learn in order to better expect what changes might be occurring? One of the other pieces is that women talked about wanting to feel normal. And this was really an important theme, and we're going to see this mirrored in the next section as well but a really deep desire to know what was normal. And this is something that also people talk, talk about across the lifespan in terms, of, in terms of their sexual life and in terms of the things that they were feeling. So what's the normal spectrum of women's sexual responses after cancer diagnosis and treatment? And this is of course an incredibly difficult question, right? But I think it's a way of trying to understand the kinds of desire that people have to understand where they fit and are they outside the norm or inside the norm? And of course, the thing is that there's very little research on sexual health with metastatic disease. So in fact, providers don't have enough information to say where the norms might be in terms of uh, the spectrum of sexual response. But I think for our purposes now, it's important to sort of note the desire that people have to see themselves as operating as normal. And I wanna highlight the anxiety that comes with feeling out of step with their peers. And in this case, peers being those other, other women who also were diagnosed with metastatic disease. And so here's a patient saying, I'd like to know how, how on a spectrum people are, like cancer people, like when do they feel sexual and when do they not? And this really brings forward the sense of the kind of normalization that medical providers can offer just in terms of having more information. So really thinking about the study is trying to provide more of a sense of what norms might look like and feel like so that there can be a sense of what patients need to feel themselves. And this is a way of thinking, which is a, um, a larger topic of what I study, which is that women describe ev evaluating their sexual health as a social process, meaning it didn't simply involve themselves an evaluation of themselves, but involved looking outwards to peers and involve the self, but also real or imagined partners, peers with and without cancer. So really trying also to help us remember that thinking about oneself and one's own sexual health involves thinking about evaluating and imagining other people, not just oneself. So sexual health is a really complicated concept that involves a whole host of, of relationships and things that are both real and hoped for and imagined. And so one of the key pieces is that women did not describe a desired return to baseline, as in before cancer. That feels like um, an important insight because what they really wanted to understand more of, which is whether or not given the new body that they were experiencing as a result of the breast cancer treatments that they'd been through, Many, many of the women said, do I look normal? I don't feel normal, but it's important to me that I look normal as a form of passing, right? As a way of trying to understand, can I still move in the world? And can I still be recognized as normal? And I wanna highlight this, which is that many wondered whether they lost something fundamental along the way. Were they still within normal human experiences? And this really came to the forefront when several women asked and still and just wondered to themselves, due to the many, many treatments that they've been through, the difficulties of living with this diagnosis, am I still human? And this to me really highlights the stresses on normalcy and also just the sense of the things that were 
asked to go through and how they might push someone out of feeling human. So the, the, the sort of porous boundaries that we might pay better attention to as we help. And maybe this means in your own life supporting those who are going through various treatments, but also really for medical providers to think through how to normalize some of the changes that people go through and the stakes for people to feel that they at times might be being pushed out of a category that feels not just superficial, but really at the level of whether they still feel human. So for folks that wanna learn a little bit more about it, I'm just including the citation here, because this is one of the things, when I give talks on this issue, um, I can't possibly, of course, include all the things that uh, the participants said in the study, but I wanted to offer folks, if that's helpful, a way of following up to learn more. So now let's turn to the, the kind of meat of this talk, which is the gender and sexual labor that women talked about. And for those that may be familiar or may not be familiar, in the last decade, there's been a real uptick of thinking about uh, kind of how women might retain their sense of femininity, even while going through best breast cancer treatment. And this is just two images that are associated with this. One is called the cancer vixen, and the other is why I wore uh, lipstick to my mastectomy. And so these two images, and there's many others, sort of highlight the way that femininity norms have been on the one hand used to help, uh, help women support feeling feminine, still while going through uh, things like chemotherapy or surgery, and that the, the norms of femininity for some have felt really supportive and a way to feel normal, like what we were just talking about. On the other hand, what this does is it also means that women who are going through what might be described as one of the hardest things in their lives of going through breast cancer treatment are still expected to do things like wear lipstick. So this puts women in a pretty uh, impossible bind about how to both feel normal. And one of the ways that we've done that is through these femininity norms, like of looking sexy or wearing lipstick. But at the same time, it introduces kinds of pressures in a place that we don't, don't often think about women experiencing the pressures of femininity, which in this case, at the end of life. So this is gonna be a thing that I, I wanna um, draw out in a bit, de a bit of detail. And the two ways that I'm thinking about this is that through these interviews, I think what the women really start to articulate is that there's these two different types of labors that they feel, gender labor and sexual labor. And here's some definitions of both. So gender labor, meaning what does it take to feel and remain properly gendered, meaning kind of look what it looks like or feels like to be a kind of a, a woman, a feminine woman who shows up um, being properly gendered, and I put that in quotes, uh, according to the norms of kind of um, US culture, and then sexual labor. And this they described as the work that it takes to become sexual, remain sexual, or potentially refuse sex or being sexually active. So here we have labor also that is involved in what does it mean to be a sexual person or maybe to opt out of being a sexual person, but the labor involved in doing that. And so let's walk through and kind of unpack what gender labor might include here. So here's a participant when she says, when I lost my hair for the first time, I was just a basket case because it felt like I felt that it so defined who I was. It just made me feel like I was pretending, you know, to be a female, to fit in with society's answer to, you know, womanhood, which is to have some sort of hair. So we see here her trying to, her trying to think through, right? That it was, a, she felt like a basket case because it so defined who she was. And then it made her feel like she was pretending to be female without hair because hair is such a central part of womanhood for her. And so this is a, a key piece where we might start to think about the loss of hair, not just as a temporary issue that women had to deal with, but something that really shook the core of how they imagined themselves. Again, whether it pushed them outside the category of woman. And again, this is not to say that it does push them outside the category of woman, but what I'm trying to articulate here is that it made it feel like that for them. The, the high association of woman, miss, and hair then when someone loses hair, it may mean that they then feel not like a woman. 
So the second piece I want to add to this gender labor is a piece about feeling fat. And this was such an important theme throughout the entire study. And I want to linger here for a minute. And I'm going to read through these quotes because I'm not sure everybody can see them. But I want to say from the outset, every single woman I interviewed in some way or another, without me asking if they felt fat or about their body necessarily, talked spontaneously about their body and their feeling fat. So I'm gonna read through the quotes and then together I can think with us through this video about what this means. So one woman says, oh, I hate my body, but it's not because of my mastectomies, it's because I'm fat, that's why. Another woman says, I guess I'm going to die fat. This is how much I detest being fat. I'm having a closed casket. I've already determined that. No way am I having all those double chins. I saw this once on a lady and I told, I told my sister, don't ever do that to me. So uh, made it emphatically, I'm having a closed casket, casket because I'm too fat. A third woman, I don't want anybody to see me. I'm fat. I used to be pretty, but I'm not anymore. And then a fourth woman, oh, I had a sexual past. I really had a good sex life. I guess if I hadn't gotten fat, and then maybe being on Depakote all these years, everything killed all that. And then the mastectomies happened and then I got even fatter. So I've become less desirable. And this to me feels like the real crux of this study because what we have here is just painful evidence of the norms of femininity lingering at the end of life. And this to me feels like something that we all wanna we all need to look at much more closely because I think as I have thought myself and written about this, as I've talked and given talks about this study, this is the moment that there's a real reckoning because I think there's a collective fantasy that as people reach the end of life, that there's some moment of release from the gendered expectations that we might have and that women might have of their own bodies. And I think what I really want people to understand is that women even near the end of life are still worrying about their body shape. And this is such an important thing to understand because we often associate these kinds of narratives with young women. And that we sort of anticipate that and think, well, young women don't like their bodies, that's too bad. Or we might even feel very angry about that, but it's really something else to see this here at the end of life for there to be such a deep theme that women who are dealing with such bigger issues to still have these negative feelings about their bodies. And for that to still be a sort of torturous thought to me is a really key piece I wanna make sure people understand because this is the thing we should feel outraged by. This is not okay that we still, uh, the gendered norms of femininity and of body size haunt women to their last day is absolutely outrageous. So this is a place that I feel like when I give this talk and were I to give this live, this is often the place that people really wanna think with me. So I wanna just make sure we lingered here. So what does it mean that there's people feeling fat at the end of life? And in this study, I wanna say 100% of the women I interviewed described this. So the role of idealized femininity across the lifespan is not something that has been given enough attention to. Ill and aging women still imagine their sexual lives as largely shaped by the expectations of others. And the messages regarding sexuality and femininity are not limited to young women. And that's an assumption I think that's really important to undo. So we'll transition now from gender labor to sexual labor. And again, sexual labor, meaning the work it takes to become, remain, and or refuse to be sexually active. So here's a quote which helps make this a little clearer. So she says, when we do anything sexual, it's mostly for his pleasure as part of keeping him smooth. If we're, gonna, if, I'm, if we're gonna be honest, I could really care less. I just want him to be happy. I'm not gonna say no to anything, so I don't. I just try to maneuver around so it doesn't hurt. And it doesn't, so we're happy. You know, I just don't wanna drive a wedge. And what we see here are several things in this quote. We, do, we see things around how people make different kinds of exchanges with a partner. We have um, someone saying that 
that she could care less, but she wants him to be happy. We also see that there is an exchange with pain. And you'll, if you'll remember one of the slides I showed earlier is that one of the things that I've written about is how young women often put up with painful intercourse in their young life. And similarly to what we just saw with feeling fat, there's a real sense of we see this kind of exchange later in life too, which is I'm willing to put up with some amount of pain in order to engage in a sexual relationship. And this is something just important to highlight. Now, there could be ways that this is something I wouldn't want for someone to do, but I also wanna say this is the kinds of ways that people decide to put their relationships together. And this is not to blame this woman, but to think through the various kinds of ways that people are trying to manage their relationships across the lifespan and in a whole host of incredibly different difficult circumstances like a metastatic disease diagnosis. So here's another woman's quote. I mean, we've tried different techniques and vibrators or whatever, and it's just, I'm just like not there. Mentally, I go somewhere else to try and avoid the pain so at least I can satisfy my husband, which then I start feeling, I don't know, a bit angry over it. So this is partly where we can see a different woman than the woman in the prior slide talking about how she does a sort of mental disassociation in order to deal with trying to maneuver her body in different ways in order to be in a sexual relationship. So this is partly where I've then theorized this to be evidence of sexual labor, meaning again, the work it takes to do this kind of uh, sexual activity. So thinking about gender labor and sexual labor together starts to highlight some unacknowledged aspects of women's sexual health discourses, meaning how sexual health has either been defined or even imagined in clinical care. And these, effort, these elements of effort, of labor, of the work that women are doing often remain out of sight because often what's happening in both research and in clinical settings is that doctors and researchers are often only asking about the frequency of sexual activity or the lubrication involved, um, but not about these other aspects about the kinds of exchanges that women are doing. So what I'm trying to do here is encourage a shift from away from studying whether or not sexual activity has resumed, which is often how um, in cancer research, there's an effort to say, well, did you resume sexual activity? And that's usually considered a, an indicator of sexual function. But what I'm trying to do is to shift away to think instead about questions of how, why, and under what conditions sexual contact, feelings, or activities do or do not occur. So this means asking different kinds of questions of patients and even potentially of their partners. Meaning, what kinds of things do you want? What are the feelings you have and the kinds of sexual activities that you are in, engaging in? And what would you wish for? What do you wish was happening? And what do you wish your partner knew? So here's again, the citation for this, for those that might wanna learn more about how I've written about this. And then we're gonna turn lastly to something that's more about the researcher and less about the researched, or in this case, the patient or participant, because this is something that I feel like is integral to the study and integral for those who are thinking either as medical providers or as researchers, or even themselves as patients about what it means to really do work where you're engaging with people on incredibly difficult topics such as this, and difficult for a whole host of reasons. Difficult because it's about things that people don't know how to talk about. Difficult because it has to do with a medical diagnosis that feels incredibly scary. Difficult because it has to do with partner dynamics, which often are not talked about outside of a relationship. Difficult because it has to do with pain and it's very hard to talk about pain. Uh, difficult because end of life is part of this conversation as well. So I wanted to just kind of close us off with thinking about what I've called vulnerable listening. And I'm calling it that as a way to really amplify what it is a researcher, I think, needs to equip themselves with in order to do this work well and in order not to burn out doing this work. And I'm just going to highlight some of the ways that other researchers have talked about this, not to indicate that this is impossible work, but it's important to account for the kinds of costs that doing this kind of work incurs, because if we don't acknowledge those costs, it then lands on individual researchers without understanding there's a way that we could think about this collectively, 
those who will do interview-based research, this is my effort to help really amplify how you might take care of yourself. But first, we'll just articulate the costs just a little bit, right? So here are other researchers. It caught me by a surprise to be so affected by someone, by the interviews I've done, but you never know who or what will affect you as people really do tend to use the interview space as an opportunity to raise all sorts of issues, which is incredibly true. And for those of you that have done interview-based research, interviews are a place where unexpected and often very difficult material emerges. Another researcher says, I mean, it broke my heart to hear the story. And every time I came back to try and analyze that material, it broke my heart. And it is true, I would say the same. And this is not a reason to not do the work, but it is a reason to understand that doing research can break your heart. And I think that that's okay. And I actually think it makes better research. So one last piece, it was costly, emotionally expensive to engage in this work. And these are all different researchers working across a whole host of different kinds of contexts. And again, I wanted to make sure that this is not to say that that means to opt out of this work, but it is to say this is work that one needs to pay attention to so that you can better develop the skills to do it. So hence, then I think I'll, I developed from doing this work myself, thinking about the concept of vulnerable listening. It focuses attention on the emotional aspects of data collection that require Metaboliza metabolization, debriefing, and collegial support. And I highlight vulnerability in order to talk about the dangers and pleasures of listening, recognizing the responsibility to take care of oneself and others, and perhaps most Im importantly, take steps to remain vulnerable even in the face of difficult and painful research. Because if we don't take good enough care of ourselves and others, we won't have the spirit, the energy, the will, and the interest to look at what things that really require our vulnerable listening selves. So this is where I write more about that for those that might be interested. But I wanna close us out with thinking through the areas we've traveled where we've thought about partner and relationship issues as they connect with illness and aging and how those connect with healthcare providers and how all of this lands on people's bodies, their intimate, their ideas of intimacy, the sex that they have or don't have, or the information that they need or don't have about any of these issues. And I wanna close with just thinking about some implications for clinical practice so that we can think about how to move this hard material into things that I think we could do with it. I think, it's probably clear, but women diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer want to know about how and when to be intimate. And that itself is probably important to emphasize because again, remember um, in the study that I highlighted, only 4% of medical providers asked women 50 to 80 ages about their sexual life. So this is actually a real call to say, women actually do want to know across different aging, age groups and illness categories. They do want to know more about how and when to be intimate. And the gender norms around sexual health make all of this very difficult to see. So the kinds of ways of um, the expectations of femininity sometimes make it hard to know what people uh, desire for themselves versus the norms that they feel like they're expected to uphold even when they're quite ill. And the, high, the uh, theme of patients and their partners, right? So increased attention to partners, not just the patients to navigate intimacy and expectations for change. And that might be physical change as well as psychological change. So just for those that might be watching this that might have kind of a ability to, to think through about how to change clinical care, one of the major recommendations I have is to include sexual health information on routine clinical checklists. Patients that I spoke to in the study routinely said that when their routine paperwork included things where they had to check off information about sexual health, it taught them things to expect. And in fact, the routine paperwork was the place that most of them said, that's where I learned that there might be sexual changes, not from my medical provider, but from the paperwork. So that just highlights the way that the, that kind of a way that the paperwork communicates with patients is incredibly important. And the things that we could include on that as educational interventions. Another key piece, which I know is incredibly difficult um, given hospital uh, 
space limitations, but many patients spoke that they did not feel that they had the kind of privacy they needed during their clinical consultation. So thinking more about privacy during routine visits with their oncologist or whomever might be tasked with helping someone think about some of these issues. And then, of course, thinking about how to provide training and discussing sexuality as part of ongoing professional development for health providers, be that in medical school, be that in social work interactions, or whatever kinds of providers, but really offering specific training that might be um, both applicable and to undo some of the expectations or assumptions that women at the end of life, be that um, because of age or illness, are imagined to, again, to be outside of the boundaries of sexuality, but to really undo that stereotype so that providers are, are attuned to the kinds of sexual health needs that women who are diagnosed with uh, metastatic disease or other diseases or women who are just nearing the end of life because of age still do need and require and want that kind of information. So I'll, I'll end with this last bullet, which is to challenge the definitions and assumptions about sexual health that limit the care women receive and limit their sexual imagination. So this is something that I think about in my work broadly, which is how do people start to imagine a sexual life? And that is across the lifespan. Sex ed in schools is one component of it, but the medical provision that we have throughout our life care, even near the end of life, is a really important component to how people imagine what they can have, what they wish they could have, what they'd like to have, but really thinking about that intimate and sexual imagination across the lifespan. And the thinking then about the role that all these different institutions and providers could have in helping people actually increase their sexual imagination rather than simply living with the norms and often restrictive norms of femininity or other kinds of uh, gender expectations that often limit people and sometimes even put them in incredibly painful or really degrading uh, positions with themselves. So really wanting to shift how we help people imagine the best for themselves and stop talking badly about themselves at the end of life. So this is the piece that I'm really aiming to change. And I think really thinking through how might we shift what sexual health includes including non-penetrative sexual activities and intimate touch, thinking about shifting the conversation about body image so that this discussion of feeling fat at the end of life is not something that we have to burden women with thinking about, supporting patients regardless of their age, relationship status, or disease progression, and also imagining patients as sexual beings at the same time as they're also being help to prepare for the end of life and being able to think about sex and the end of life simultaneously. So with that, I will close with the original list of terms that I put together as a way of really allowing these terms to live together because they are often not, they're often not put together. And if those are if folks wanna have, ask any questions, I'm, I'm happy to um, receive questions and here's my email. And also thanks for the two funders for this study. And with that, I'll close. That was, that was excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was really uh, very powerful. Um, I want to start actually, I guess with the, um, your, uh, the email that you just had up. So if, if um, I don't know if all those articles, so thanks for uh, sharing those, the, uh, the information for the articles. I'm not sure if any of them are behind a paywall, but if people have difficulty, if they're interested and they have difficulty accessing them, uh, perhaps they could email you and you could send them a copy if that's, if that's okay. I'd be more than happy to. Yeah, great. Um, Okay, and the, the first question I had, uh, I was thinking about um, maybe not always uh, an oncologist, maybe the best go-to person for some of this stuff. I was wondering about the role of sex therapists at hospitals and how common that is at hospitals and uh, like serious medical situations like what you're talking about and at what point they're brought into a case or to work with a patient? Is that common or? 
That's an excellent question. And an important context for this particular study is that the, there is um, sex therapy resources available at this particular hospital. Um, and I asked patients and uh, throughout the study if they both knew of those resources and if they felt comfortable accessing those resources. And about half knew that there were sex therapy resources um, available to them through the hospital. And uh, nearly all of them said that they did not feel comfortable accessing those resources. It felt too uncomfortable to talk with a stranger. Now, wow. this is, of course, interesting because I was also a stranger. But the sense of sex therapy introduced a kind of taboo, a, a nervousness, a discomfort um, that made that resource, even though it's an incredibly important resource, I think it made it feel out of, out of reach for them. Mm -hmm. The other key piece of this is that they assumed it was for younger women. Mm -hmm. So that the kinds of expectations that they themselves had about who wants sex therapy, right? These are because the, we all live in these gender norms and these expectations is that they thought that was for other, other people, not yes. themselves. Younger women, more sexually active women, women who didn't have metastatic disease. So for them, it was a sense of like, that's for people who aren't near the end of life. So they're not routinely brought on sex therapists, but they are usually just made available. But I can tell you from this study, um, these women thought of it as kind of outside their comfort zone. I see. And so really it's not just an automatic um, step where the, you, you get to meet the sex therapist. It's something that the patient then has to take the initiate then. Yeah, and I think, I mean, these kinds of situations might change in the hospital, so I can't speak to what it looks like now, but generally that's how the resources have been, is that they're, uh, they're voluntary, and they're, usually it's, there's a lot of information in the waiting room, and so people are made aware of it, but it's by the patient's own agency to get to it. Sure, okay, okay, all right, that's too bad, hopefully that will um, change some, but okay, okay. Um, the other question I had uh, was about um, qualitative and quantitative research. And um, just to, for the broader audience, I, that's the, mo I would think that most psychology research is on quantitative, which is more looking at data, looking at means, doing statistical analyses. But there's another area, and that, which you spoke about, I believe you do both, but you were speaking about the interviews or that's more qualitative data. And I, what I love so much about the qualitative work is it really humanizes and really brings home a lot of this work where often we're, we as psychologists, myself included, like really kind of just crunch numbers and don't think about often lose sight of the, the personal story. And um, what was so moving about this, obviously a, a big part of it was just these, these stories and these quotes were so powerful that she gave out. I just wonder if you could talk a bit about that in your experience. I mean, you mentioned the, the um, how, you know, it's emotionally difficult work, but uh, how you see all of, like the qualitative versus quantitative uh, how they complement each other and how, how qualitative work really fits in here and why it's so important. I mean, I think for exactly some of the reasons you just said is that there, it, it really puts the humanness at the front and center. Um, and with, with quantitative research, it often reduces people to a kind of response that they gave on a survey. So a one to five response or whether or not they did something in experiment, so a kind of yes or no response. Um, but to me, qualitative, and qualitative can be lots of different things. It can include asking people questions on a survey to fill out you know, a little bit more about themselves. But really what the data I provided here today are these kind of more traditional long lasting interviews. And I only met with them once, right? Other qualitative researchers might meet with someone repeatedly. As a qualitative researcher, in this case, it felt to me really important to limit the time that I asked participants to talk with me because I was very aware that their time was limited. So I took the time very seriously that they, that they gave to me. So I would not have designed this study to meet with people regularly or even routinely because I wanted to respect that time was short. The piece though, I think that feels important to say, and I, I hope comes across, and if not, I want to highlight, which is people are also incredibly complicated. 
and they hold a range of complicated ideas about themselves and others. And one of the things I worry most about in quantitative research is that we lose that complexity and we lose the contradictions that people think or the compromises people make or the turns and logic that people do in order to, in order to be with others, with themselves, um, in order to have lives that they can manage. So the complexity that, a, that an interview offers is I think a really key piece to, to both remind ourselves that people, ourselves included, um, have hopes that don't always make sense. We make compromises. We don't always wish we would. Um, we want things that are out of reach. And so the, the ways of thinking about talking with someone, and this is a thing that I both do a lot in my own research, I train graduate students to do, is really to sit with what that complexity feels like and not to question it, but to figure out how to document it and how to use it in the service of larger questions like clinical care, like relationship research, uh, like end of life issues. So to, to feed that complexity back into things that require kind of deep thought, right? We don't want clinical care that ignores the humanness either. So really how to weave those things together. Okay. Um, well, you know, I think I will leave it there. That was really, that was really great. Thanks. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sarah McClellan for, for doing this. And wonderful. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs>